um, the question of investment and investment chapters uh, in free trade agreements. I want you to think about 10 years ago when there were a number of domestic proposals uh, to change the standards on takings in U.S. law, that is, um, to lower the, uh, the threshold by which a private investor could seek compensation as a result of some sort of government uh, action. Uh, in the early 1990s, there was an attempt to essentially strip these kinds of regulatory takings cases out of state courts, federalize them, and reduce what, um, for example, um, Justice Scalia had said is sort of a 95% threshold in terms of a taking down to 25%, meaning that rather than being uh, a takings defined as an almost total occupation or, um, or a loss of value of property and an investment, it would be a, a much lower standard. And state court after state court reject this radical approach to property rights. And equally importantly, so did Congress. Every single one of those bills that came before Congress in the early 1990s was rejected. So why am I talking about this now? Because we're again fighting this war. And how are we fighting this war? These investment agreements, starting with NAFTA in the mid-1990s, provisions were inserted into free trade agreements that essentially codified this agenda that was being sought but turned away at the domestic level. And now we're having to deal with it in the context of these free trade agreements. So very quickly, I'm going to talk about that history just a little bit, talk about the current state of play, talk a little bit about the deal and what, uh, what's in that deal and what should be done in relation to investment. So just very quickly, looking at, at NAFTA and the successor uh, agreements, um, they all have what's called an investor state mechanism. They all have an investment chapter, which has the following characteristics. First of all, very plain, put it very plainly, it gives corporations the right to sue governments. Uh, second, it has a radically expanded definition of what constitutes uh, expropriation, a definition which, as I noted earlier, has been rejected by domestic courts and by the Congress previously. Uh, third, um, corporations can be awarded damages when governments fail to provide what's called a minimum standard of treatment. And that's been defined, or that definition has been pushed by the International Corporate Bar to say any change in regulation, we, our clients, deserve to have a predictable and stable regulatory environment, which means you can't react to new information, new, new scientific information, new public health concerns. Nope, have to have a stable and predictable regulatory environment. If you do not, you have failed to meet a standard of minimum treatment, and therefore it's actionable. Corporations can sue governments. Uh, after NAFTA and the successor agreements, starting with Chile-Singapore, um, a outrageous amendment to the investment chapters was put in place, which basically now allows subsidiaries of U.S. corporations to bring claims through the international investment arbitration system against laws or ordinances passed democratically at federal, state, or local level. Let me say that again. Subsidiaries of U.S. corporations can now sue the United States using the international investment agreements. There's no requirement that an investor needs to go through the domestic courts. One of the cases that's um, currently uh, uh, pending in the international, uh, that's being adjudicated through a NAFTA uh, arbitral panel uh, is called the Glamis case. A Canadian mining company was unhappy with some of uh, California's environmental regulations with respect to mining. Uh, and he is on the record as having said, we didn't take this to the California state courts because we thought we'd have a better chance of uh, gaining victory and getting compensation if we brought this uh, through the NAFTA investment system. Finally, there is no public morals exception in the investment chapters. Uh, a public morals exception is found in some of the other uh, FTAs and, and in some of the WTO agreements. Uh, so all these are a, a, a huge derivation from what we think of in terms of U.S. constitutional standards with respect to the protection of investment. Um, perhaps most importantly, however, is the procedural question. So I want to say just a word about that. As noted, 
these international investment uh, disputes are not being uh, arbitrated through domestic courts. They're going through what's called an international investment uh, panel, international, uh, and, and that is comprised of three judges, one chosen by the company, or by the company, one chosen by the corporation, and a third that's mutually agreed upon between the two. Um, there is no system of precedent in law, as one would find uh, in the U.S. court system. And uh, there is no requirement that the judges uh, be uh, American citizens or even relatively familiar with U.S. constitutional law. Let's talk a little bit about the state of play. There is an investment chapter with these investor state rights, that is the ability of corporations to sue governments, included in all four of the pending FTAs. I want to focus on Panama briefly, because Panama has sort of escaped our notice thus far as a, an agreement. It's seen as a very small agreement. But here's a couple of facts about Panama that I think we ought to pay attention to. Number one is, it's already a very low tariff environment. So the kinds of market access arguments that one might make with respect to Peru, uh, they don't hold water with respect to Panama. Um, what, does, what does Panama have? Well, it's a significant agreement in that there is more investment flowing into Panama, that is foreign investment coming into Panama, than is true of all of the CAFTA countries. So with respect to investment, Panama is an extremely significant agreement. Another fact, Panama has 400,000 registered corporations. A big chunk of those are subsidiaries of U.S. corporations. Um, for example, uh, we, just a, a, a quick uh, scan of a GAO document, we found that there are 32 Panama domiciled, that is Panama-based uh, corporate subsidiaries among the 100 largest uh, U.S. federal government contractors. And McDermott Industries, which is the third largest homeland security contract uh, uh, recipient, has seven subsidiaries in Panama alone. Panama is known as a tax haven, it has a very murky banking sector, and it has never at any point signed a tax disclosure treaty with the United States. So one has to ask, what is this Panama Agreement really about? Where is Panama's area of economic comparative advantage and what do they want? What they want is investment and what we think this will result from this agreement with respect to investment is more tax dodging, more profit laundering, and a great incentive and a great encouragement for what's called a, a corporate inversion. That is, you create a subsidiary or you reposition uh, your headquarters in Panama to take advantage of banking secrecy and other uh, kinds of provisions. Um, and again, subsidiaries based in Panama, should this agreement go through, they will have the right to challenge laws and ordinances passed by uh, state and local governments in the United States. Um, so, at a minimum, I, I would suggest that we might want to visit the question of whether it's time to reward Panama, a known tax haven, a country that has refused to sign a tax disclosure treaty with the United States. Should this country be rewarded with a free trade agreement with the United States? How about we not put the cart before the horse? How about we start with a tax disclosure agreement with the government of Panama, and then we'll talk about an FTA? Fine. So let me talk now about uh, the deal, as it's known. Uh, we've seen press releases now from Ways and Means and from the Speaker's Office suggesting that, that um, they've secured a commitment on what's called no greater rights for foreign investors, that is, a way to discipline uh, this NAFTA-era system. But if one looks at the trade facts released by uh, the Office of the United States Trade Representative, USTR, if you look at their press release, they note the following. They note that the language on no greater rights is preambular. That is, it's going to show up in the preamble, not necessarily in the operational sections of the text. And secondly, they note that uh, there will be no greater substantive rights. That is, the procedural rights, the ability to use this uh, arbitration system that does an end run, end run around the U.S. courts, that will remain in place. So my message is, this is not progress. Essentially, we already have that. We already have the no greater substantive rights language in the 2002 Act. And so with respect to investment, the deal is no progress whatsoever. There is no progress. There, there is nothing on no greater rights that actually means anything. Um, do cities and states care about this? Are they, are they concerned? Well, 
yes, indeed they are, in fact, for the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I want to make clear I'm not speaking on behalf of NCSL or for NCSL, but I just want to reference their policy. Since uh, the early part of this decade, NCSL has had a policy opposing greater procedural and greater substantive rights for foreign investors. They want to see this private right of action by corporations to sue governments not reformed, but eliminated. NCSL, other groups have engaged with U.S. trade negotiators. There's been numerous letters from governors, from state legislators and whatnot, and nothing's happened. So what we know from this is it's got to be Congress. Congress has to push on the no greater rights uh, question. Um, only Congress can fix this by, by eliminating this, this threat to our laws, to our system of federalism, and to our democratic practice. <laughs>